Oh, let, let's do that again. Good morning, Eden Baptist. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you guys uh, here in person. Those that are watching uh, online, we just want to welcome you guys. Thank you so much for uh, your continual support uh, to this local church. Uh, that, that the Holy Spirit is present every single Sunday, every time the doors are open. Uh, the Spirit of God is, is alive and well, and we're so thankful for the Spirit um, of God in this place, that we can honor and worship Him through everything that we do, not just when we're on campus, but the Spirit of God that, that lives in our lives, that we can go out, that lives within us as we go into this community, as we go into this world, into our workplaces, into... Uh, the restaurants that we go eat at, that we can share the love uh, and show the love of Jesus Christ uh, within our lives. Uh, today was a, an awesome day because in the first service we had the privilege of ordaining uh, Kevin Matthews. And it was a, it's a sacred time because uh, God's calling uh, is on so many uh, people in this, in this life. God's calling is, is on every single one of us that know him personally. But specifically within the life of the church, uh, we have deacons and we have pastors. And as Pastor Jeff uh, talked about and he's going to talk about, um, we're uh, looking forward to that. But they are called and they are to be ordained because Jesus has set them apart, not, not just to be leaders, uh, but the greatest quality of a leader is to serve. And so I thank uh, God for Kevin. I thank God for all the deacons. Uh, for Pastor Jeff and the servant uh, mindset that, uh, that is on display every single uh, day here at our church. Uh, but a couple other things wanted to mention next Sunday, uh, which will be March the 14th, um, we are going to be taking up our end gathering for the Annie Armstrong uh, ministry that is available uh, for so many people. Uh, Annie Armstrong began a ministry uh, and really, uh, uh, who was a leader, a woman, a strong woman leader um, within uh, God's kingdom to work within the uh, North American Mission Board uh, so that we can share the gospel with people within our own country. Uh, a lot of times we think about sending evangelists, sending um, uh, missionaries out to other worlds, out to other uh, other countries and continents, uh, but never really think about it coming here. And so that's what the end gathering will be set up for next Sunday morning. We are going to be supporting uh, North American missions. And, uh, and that includes not just North America, uh, the United States, but also Canada and the territories within it. And it gives us opportunities to plant churches within all of the, the cities, within uh, uh, areas that are deprived of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so what you give is goes so uh, and goes so far in providing uh, the gospel to so many people that need it. Um, and also this morning we had the great opportunity to start back uh, Sunday school, and I'm so thankful for uh, all of our leaders, the reopening team, and the heart that God has given them to begin. Uh, meeting for Sunday school again. So thank you guys again for coming this morning. I'm going to pray and we'll begin our time of worship. God, thank you so much for today, Lord. Thank you for this time that we can come before your throne. Lord, that we can interact with you uh, face to face. God, that we can interact with you in a personal way. And Lord, we seek to do that every single Sunday morning as we worship you through prayer, through, through song, and through studying your word. And I pray that you would continue to do that here in this place today. Lord, speak to us and speak through us today. Lord, as we seek to lift your name above every other name. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if everyone will stand with us, we're going to sing Victory in Jesus, the first and third verses. And we don't have words, but I know you know these, so praise with me. Everybody stand. Just blood. 
Amen. As we get into our time of uh, taking up our tithes and offerings, we have a couple designated areas on both sides uh, where the buckets are at here on the the ground level and then up in the balcony as well. So as uh, after we pray, uh, please make your way to the, to the buckets. And um, I pray that, that God would lead in your decision on what to give. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time of uh, serving you, Lord. Uh, we serve you in so many ways, every aspect of our life, God, whether we think about it or not. And so many times, Lord, we make intentional decisions to serve you. And I pray that this morning as we look to give back to you, Lord, as we support the local church, but as we support, more than anything, the furthering of the gospel, the going out into the community, I pray that you would allow what is given, Lord, to be blessed. And those that give, God, out of an open heart, Lord, that you would bless them as well. And Lord, your hand is upon this church, and we thank you for that. Every life, every person represented here in person or online, Lord, is a soul, not a number, but a soul, a life that is intended to serve you. So let us serve you well today, Lord, especially this morning as we give. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We had a really good life back in Brazil, a really comfortable life in Brazil. My wife, uh, she was a lawyer for the government, and uh, I was uh, a pastor in my, in my church. And then I visited a friend here in New England. He showed me around, and he showed me people not knowing Jesus. We got over uh, 500,000 Brazilians living in all New England. And then I realized that God was calling us. We took the flight and we landed here in, uh, in Boston. 20 days after this, my wife delivered our daughter. I spoke uh, zero English at that time. It wasn't easy, our beginning here. I had to be strong for my wife and for my daughter. So I didn't give myself this opportunity to give up. And I remember that my first job was working at a Dunkin' Donuts. So I met a few Brazilians there and we started some small groups. And our focus was really specific to reach non-believers and to reach people who, who didn't know Jesus. So basically, my ministry is based on a friendship. And uh, the people who attend the church uh, are your friends. We started like, gathering with people and we found a place and uh, we started doing Sunday services. When people give, they are really helping uh, some families to thrive and to survive, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the journey. For me and for my family, it's been uh, uh, vital. What I'm learning is if God called you, He will provide. Good morning. <clears throat> you know, I can't do anything. I can't even walk without the Lord holding my hand. I thought the number one would surely be me. I thought I could be what I wanted to be. I thought I could build on life sinking sand, but I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. The mountain the valley's too wide, and down on my knees, I learned 
to stand because I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I thought I could do a lot on my own. I thought I could make it all alone. I thought of myself as a mighty big man, but I can't even walk without you holding my simple as it may be, we can't even walk without the Lord holding our hand. Can I testify just a little? One Sunday, I made Jesus my all in all. When I get in trouble, only his name I'll call. If I don't trust in him, I'd be less than a man because I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. The mountain's too high and the valley Without you holding my hand. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jim. Church, do you enjoy that? Say amen. 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 Thank you, Jim Hall. I appreciate that, my brother. And Shannon, thank you so much. Uh, Lydia was uh, going to be playing this morning. Brenda's out of town. Lydia was going to be playing, and Lydia was not feeling well this morning, so Shannon sh stepped in very short notice. Thank you for that. And she and Jim put that together this morning. Thank you, my brother. We really appreciate uh, all the talent that is, is in Enon Baptist Church. It's... Uh, Y'all are always a blessing. Well, church family, this morning we had a very special service uh, to ordain a new deacon. And I thought long and hard about what I would, I would preach this morning. And I wanted you to get the same message that we got this morning that we were talking about with deacons. Because you know the work that deacons are called to. The work that God calls these very special men to is a, it's an important work. It's important that we understand it. So I wanted to share with you a little of the message from this morning's service in hopes that not only will you leave this place having a better understanding of what it is when God calls a man to serve as a deacon, but also that you'll understand, have a better understanding of God's expectation on that man. And also on his family. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, as we open this, this time of the message, Lord God, we want to come into your throne room. And we thank you for this unique position, Lord, that you created, that you called these men to. This position of a servant leader. 
Father, we understand that every single man, woman, and child that is a part of your church, that we're all your servants. And then, Lord God, for you to do what only you can and to reach into that body of believers and say, I'm going to choose these for a special role, for a special responsibility, and for special service in my church. Father, what a great blessing that you would do that in and through your church. Father, let this message be a message that speaks to our hearts. Not only, Lord, so we'll know how to pray for these, these very special servant leaders, but Lord God, so that we will we'll understand the, the, the burden for your kingdom that you put on them. We praise you for this opportunity to worship. We praise you for this opportunity to gather this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there are two offices, if you will, in the church that have the distinction of requiring ordination. Pastor, of course, is one of them. But the second is that for the office of deacon. This morning we gathered at the 9 a.m. service, Kevin's request, to set him aside for, as a Christian brother, for ordination as deacon. It is a precious service. But that term deacon is one that's so very often within God's church, I don't think we understand. So very often we think of the term deacon, well, they're the ones that they're going to make the decisions. That's really not what the position is about. Is that part of it? Yes, because as Southern Baptists, we've kind of incorporated that role of deacon with that of, um, with that of overseer, with that of elder, if you will. But what that term deacon literally means, in the Greek it's diakonos. It's found 29 times throughout the New Testament. And it literally means a special minister or a special servant. So that kind of tells us where we get the word deacon from. It kind of tells us what the word means. But we need to understand what the Bible says about these special people in God's church called deacons. Why do we have them? And what their job is. So if you haven't already, I'll invite you to go ahead and take your copy of God's Word and meet me over in the book of Acts, chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, the book of Acts, chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. All that can, please stand in honor and in reverence to the reading of God's inerrant and infallible Word. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says this, Now in those days... When the number of the disciples was multiplying, notice that, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren... Seek out from among you seven good men, excuse me, seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procorius, Nicanor, Timon, Herminius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples, here it is again, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. By the Lord had his blessings to the reading of his word. Church family, you can be seated. I want you to notice something here right off the bat. Notice that what is happening here, if you look back into verse 1, 
Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, so the church is growing rapidly, that presents its, it presented its challenge. And then I want you to notice after they took this action of calling these deacons, of establishing this office within God's church, the church grew even greater. So this passage is about the birth of the office of deacon. It's about service. We are all called to serve the kingdom. But this is a whole new level of ministry here in the church. But I want you to notice here we also see that this arose out of a problem. There were some widows that were being neglected. You see two groups or two cliques we see right here within the early church. One is complaining and is grumbling about the actions of the other. And whenever you got that kind of stuff going on, it's always a bad thing. One group felt that its needs were not being met and it was not getting the due share of attention and care that it deserved. And, and then, of course, um, that, that group um, were, were the Hebrews, the, the Jews who were born. And um, well, let me back up. One of those groups, of course, as I mentioned, is the Hebrews. They were the Jews that were born and raised um, there in, in Palestine. And they spoke Aramaic, uh, the, the language that had been... Um, had come down from their ancient uh, Hebrew language. They, they rejected all Gentile and, and Greek culture completely. And they used only the Hebrew Bible in the original Hebrew language. They were, they were so inclusive, so closely knit they despised all Gentiles and all Gentile culture. They actually despised, and some writers I have read talked about how they cursed the Gentiles, believing that the Gentiles were cursed eternally by God. This dislike even included the Jews from Greece that had been forced to relocate by the Romans. The, the other group, of course, are these Grecian Jews. These, these Hellenists, if you will. They're Jews that have been scattered, um, dispersed all over the world by the Roman persecution. Many of them would return for some of the great feasts, the Feast of Pentecost, Passover, etc. And apparently many had been converted on the day of Pentecost, or they had been converted thereafter, we don't know. But we know that there arose an issue here, for the, the Grecian, the Hellenistic Jews, had adopted a Greek culture. They spoke the Greek language, they used and read the Greek Bible, the Septuagint. And it's very possible that some of this began to create some friction we got kind of two different groups coming from two different cultures. And one is saying that, hey, the needs of our group are not being met. Regardless, it is clear the apostles saw this and said, hey, this is more than we can handle on our own. The needs of the church are not getting met. So something has got to happen. So they go before the Lord. And this is the request from what we read here. That they would set from God's church a group of men called to special service, to special ministry. And that they would carry out these duties. I can tell you from first-hand experience. It, it takes a lot of time to prepare a message, to prepare a sermon. And I think Ben can amen that. It takes a lot of time. 
So to have this great privilege to study God's Word, to focus on praying over what God would have be preached from this pulpit, and to know that there's this amazing group of men like we have here at Enon Baptist Church that are serving and working out in the congregation all the time. It blesses my soul to no end. And I'm very grateful for each and every one of them. The truth is, the, the duties of a deacon, they not really changed it over 2,000 years. The church still has a need for Men are going to, who are going to take the time to look after the day-to-day -day activities of the church so that people like Ben and I can devote more time to the study of the Word, to prayer and to the preaching of the Word. So let's spend just a couple of minutes here looking at some of the qualifications. And I want you to see these this morning because I want you to know not only how to pray for Kevin as a newly ordained deacon, but I want you to know how to pray for each one of these men that God has called and set apart. Because he just might call and set apart some more in the days ahead. And when he does, you need to understand when God comes knocking at your heart's door, you need to be prepared. So let's talk about these qualifications just a moment. The first and obviously the most important qualification for a deacon is that a deacon must be a child of God. A deacon must be a saved man. Now look with me here in our focal passage at verse 3. Notice this. It says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men. Notice this. Seek out from among you. Seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So notice here, the instruction is, is, hey, congregation, you set these men aside from the family. Set them apart for work. These men were chosen. They were saved men without exception, yes. But we can glean here from this passage that the command is that they would come from the body of believers. These would be men that had been observed. These would be men that were trusted. These were to be men that were men of honor, men of respect, men of character and integrity. These were men that had the respect of the congregation. But notice there's more. Notice that they are to be full of the Holy Spirit. And they're to be full of wisdom. In other words, they're to be led by the Holy Spirit. They're to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Listen, you can't be a leader in God's church if you're not going to let Him lead you. And that doesn't matter what position you're taking on. You can't be a leader in God's church if he's not in control of your heart. If he's not in control of your life. I don't care what you're doing. If you're going to serve him, he's got to be in control. You must be led by the Holy Spirit. For a servant, for a deacon, that's the absolutely essential. For the remaining qualifications, I want to invite you to, to turn with me in your copy of God's Word, whether that's on your phone or your tablet or, or your hard copy of God's Word like I've got here in my hands. Meet me over in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to begin reading in verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 8.
Notice what this passage says. Likewise. Don't you see that first word there? Likewise. We're going to come back to why that's important here in just a moment. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Notice that. Let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So notice here in Paul's writing to Timothy some of the qualifications that Paul says here to Timothy. As we just read from Acts, we know that the first thing, the most essential thing, is this person that is is called and set apart by God's church to be a special minister or a special servant must be a child of God. We've established that first. But the second thing we see here is that a deacon must be a servant. Notice that this passage, I told you, to to pay attention to that first word there in verse 8, it says likewise. This comes right after that of a pastor. And this indicates that God has equally important standards for the deacon as he does for the pastor. Why? Because the deacon and the pastor are to work together to lead God's church, to to make certain that everything that is said and done is in obedience to God first. Everything that is said and done will honor Him first and bring glory to Him. The deacon is to work with the pastor in guiding the affairs of God's church. But notice what kind of servants these men are to be. Notice verse 8 with me. Likewise, deacons must be reverent. Boy, there's a big word. Not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. So notice this word here. Deacons must be reverent. Or grave, depending upon which translation you're reading. In other words, these are men who are to be serious about their duty. Serious about their responsibility. Also notice here, they're not to be double-tongued. Well, that that's, refers to somebody who, in other words, they're not to be somebody who will say, well, they'll say one thing to this person over here to gain their favor. And then they'll say something totally different over here to this other person, trying to gain, make them like them too. Sometimes you have to make hard decisions. And you can't, as the old saying goes, you can't play both sides. Sometimes you have to make hard decisions. And as the word says here, They can't be double-tongued. In other words, there's somebody whose word you've got to be able to count on. When they tell you something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Or there'll be a very serious reason as to why it didn't. A deacon is to be a man whose word means something. Whose word is one you can count on. Now notice this next one, not given too much wine. My interpretation of Scripture, don't make me right, but everybody hear me. My interpretation of Scripture. I don't see where the Bible explicitly demands total 
abstinence here, but the Bible is very clear about the importance of sobriety. Now notice here verse 8 one more time. Not greedy for money. A deacon is to be a man with a, a proper spiritual attitude towards money. That's important. But then notice verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Notice that. But let these also first be tested. Let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Notice that first phrase right here in verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. In other words, a deacon is to be a man of God's word. A man who is well grounded in the basic doctrines of the faith. But then notice right here in verse 10, there are also to be men that are tested. In other words, they've been examined by the congregation. The congregation has looked at them and said, yes, they meet these qualifications that have been set aside. And we believe that they fulfill those qualifications. But you know what? One of the things that so often we miss is these servant leader qualifications. They don't stop and start. I said that backwards. They don't start and stop here in God's house. They don't start and end here at all. They also apply to the home. So notice verse 11 with me. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their houses well. A deacon must be a spiritual shepherd, a spiritual leader, not just in God's church, but also in his household. So many times we think of if someone's in control of their household. They're like a drill sergeant. They're barking orders. Uh-uh. That's what, not what's referred to here. This is referring to a man who, who has earned the love and the respect of his family. A man who nurtures his family. A man who cares for his family. You see, that's also part of his role in God's church. Is to nurture the family. To care for the family of God. Also, I want you to notice here, I know my time is getting away from me. But I want you to notice here that a deacon is to be a defender. Deacon's not just a servant of, of, of the people, but he's also a defender. Look one more time with me in verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let these also first be tested. Let them serve as deacon, being found blameless. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. It's important for us to understand that a deacon, along with a pastor, is responsible. It's one of the things Ben and I talk about right often is that we are responsible as spiritual shepherds within the church of, of protecting the doctrinal purity of the church. This is part of the heritage that we are to hand down to future generations. I'm so glad to have all these little ones over here on this side this morning. 
when we look at y'all, we've got a role to make sure the things we do with God's church leaves things right so when you are leading God's church, we've left right stuff for you. We've left things correctly. In closing, I want to leave this with you this morning. Think about the, the, what we expect from this role of deacon. So many times we put a whole lot of other stuff in there. But what God's word says is most important is first that there be a child of God. Second, that they be a servant. That they work with the pastors hand in hand to serve God's church. And lastly, they've got to be a defender of, of Scripture and a defender of God's church. I know that here this morning, there's a lot of men in here that are already ordained as deacons and maybe some that are going to be ordained in the days ahead. I want to say this to you. The need has not changed in over 2,000 years. The office is not about position. The office is not about power. It's about being diakonos, a servant of the king. The work sometimes is downright hard, but the rewards of serving God serving his church and this very special role and those are out of this world if you're with us this morning I want to ask everybody just to stand for just a minute this is going to be in way of invitation there's nobody looking around there's nobody watching it's just this camera that's right up here on me I promise I realize this service has been just a little bit different, but understand this is an opportunity God has brought to you to understand how to pray for these very special servants that God's called. Because He can't make them and knock at your heart's door and say, I need for you to serve. I want to challenge you. Pray for these men. Man, it's an honor to serve with them. And we're blessed to have some of the best right here in Enon Baptist Church. I'm thankful for each and every one of them. But I want to ask you this morning, just in a way of invitation and a way of closing, every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed for just a moment. Again, no cameras are on except the one looking right here at me. If there's a burden that's on your heart, and I can pray alongside you. Would you just lift your hand? Nobody's looking around, it's just me. I see that hand. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. I see that hand, yes. All going up all over the house, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I see those hands. Yes, ma'am, I see that. Yes, sir, I see that hand. I want to ask you one more question. And this is to you at home as well. When you think about your heart, is everything okay between you and Jesus? If it is not, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe, Lord Jesus, you have the power to save my soul. I want to confess my sin to you and I want to dedicate the rest of my life to serving you. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer and you're with us online this morning, 
I want to invite you to give us a call here at the office. We would love to spend some time talking with you. If not, God's Word says that we would make that profession of faith public. And I want to ask you to do that. Call a friend that you know is a Christian. In the meantime, we thank you for joining us here this morning. We thank you for listening to this very special service. Have a blessed day.